So I've been, I've been sober for about six and a half years now. So mental health, thank you. Um, well done. There's a lot of discussion about mental, stig mental health stigmatisms and getting help or addiction, recovery, especially in the Asian community. And so when I got sober six and a half years ago, I think the first thought was, will people still like me? Mm -hmm. um, will I be still desirable, attractive, or will I have friends? Will I succeed in life? Because I, I also know that in Asian community, drinking is a big way of doing business. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, man, I'm going to be poor and no one's going <laughs> to like me. <laughs> like, uh, it's going to uh. be great. But it's actually the opposite that happened in my life. When I got help and started to uh, get sober, that's when my life really started to uh, explode. And I started to live a life beyond my wildest dreams. So that's the other side I think a lot of people don't know. Come home, the outside world looks a certain way, treats us a certain way. And we want to belong. We want to fit in. And when we look at TV, film, media, for me growing up, the attractive, desirable guy was not the Asian guy. Mm -hmm. It was usually the guy who was made fun of, the joke, the martial artist who taught people. Like, I didn't aspire to be like Mr. Miyagi or anything, you know, and that's <laughs> the only male representative I had. <laughs> and so uh, I think belonging is, to me, is looking for what we all have in common. Because when I started to look at, even when I was younger, being Asian and seeing my family who was white or mm -hmm. seeing other Asians in school, I would always look and be like, nah, they're not like me, you know, because, you know, that person's Chinese, I'm Korean, or that person's, you know, female and Korean, whatever. It just, I never saw the things that made us the same. And I think that made me feel not like I belonged anywhere in the white community, even with my family, the other Asian community who actually lent their hand out to me at some points. You know, when I was in college, they wanted me to join the uh, Asian fraternity, right? And I was like, ah, no, nah, I'm, not, I'm not like them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to do that. Is there a keg there? No, I'm not going, <laughs> right? It's just so, I think for me, belonging is looking to see what we all have in common and the experience of being Asian, which is we actually never felt like we belonged at some point mm. of our lives. So I think that to me is, is feeling like I belong now. But from my experience for a couple movies that I've done that are independently financed and everything, uh, it was a little disappointing the risk tolerance that Asian Americans had to invest in our own community, our own stories, our own movies. Uh, when you really look at it, the majority were actually white investors. Mm. Uh, people who literally were like, you know, I believe in you guys. So then, you know, I took my movies to actually a few Asian investors and they gave me every excuse under the sun. Mm. My family office, which means it's them, right? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean, I, I, this is a <laughs> probably different thing. But uh, I just think it's a lot of BS that comes out of people who have the money um, and want to invest in, in our, own, our own community. And so I think that part, I'd like to see change because like you said, we have that economic power. Why aren't we reinvesting in ourselves, mm. right? And why is it coming from other ethnic yeah, communities yeah. right now? Yeah. Uh, we have so much opportunity now and so much diversity and we all have diverse stories, we have immigrant stories, people from Korea, Northern Korea, everything. But what I'm finding is that in our diversity, we're starting to become very exclusive within each other because we are so diverse. But what I find is disheartening is, um, you know, only in our community can you not play like a Korean if you're Chinese, right? Or if you're uh, Malaysian, you got, you know, it's, it's one of those weird things that I find that we become a little bit too narrow in what we're casting for roles or TV or film. I mean, we get so specific sometimes that sometimes I just throw my hands up. I'm like, why don't we just shoot a documentary? You know, like, why are we doing a film and storytelling? Mm. And like, I don't know the history, and I hope I don't get shot for this, but like, I don't know the history behind the casting for Kim's Convenience with Simu, but Simu's not Korean. But we don't really like say like, get rid of Kim's Convenience. You know, it was a great film. The guy wasn't Korean. I'm Korean, I don't care. He played it great, you know? Like, it's called acting. Mm. They're storytellers, mm. you know? And so I find 
we as a community, not all, right? Sometimes there's a small majority who like feel the need to be heard, so they make a big backlash and like pick out the things that are so different and why it shouldn't be told that way. But so I think as a community, one of the biggest obstacles we need to overcome is that our attention is our currency in Hollywood. What we watch, what, what we pay attention to is what generates revenue in Hollywood. We need to put our attention on those films and like, for instance, I don't know how many people watch Joe Coy's Easter Sunday here. I mean, right? Just because I'm not Filipino doesn't mean I don't want to watch it and it shouldn't <laughs> be celebrated. Yeah. But there are people out there who say, well, that's bull. That's no, nah, I'm not Filipino. And then they start bashing on our own stuff and it doesn't do us any good. It was a good movie. It wasn't groundbreaking, but it was still a good movie. And my thing is what we do as a community, you'll see that the hardest critics are our own people. And then we're talking about, oh, I don't want to be associated with my mother because they were so hard on us. But yet then we go out and do the same thing to other people. So I think we no, really need point. to really look at ourselves, yeah, no, that's check a ourselves point. a little bit. And uh, I think it all leads into uh, just wanting to be heard. But I feel like we could do it in a different way. And we can actually lend a hand to other Asians, even though I'm not Filipino mm. <laughs> or I'm not Vietnamese or Chinese, you know. We can all lend a hand, no matter if we're a different culture. Yeah. Uh, I think partially we are also um, our worst enemies um, as well in this. We, we need to also stop shooting ourselves in our foot when something is successful or there's a chance for something. I've seen, and look, I'm guilty of this too, mm. right? Like I sometimes might look at something and be like, ah, oh, no, not this way, right? Or I want to tear it down. Mm. But it's like actually it's really doing for the better good. Um, I think it almost represents what we're going through today, right? We're such a divided country. And I think as an AAPI community, we, we should sa stand in solidarity mm -hmm. and celebrate our differences too, instead mm -hmm. of trying to make, it, make our differences and point them out to feel better about ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I find that too much will look at every difference that one community of the Asian community has to make our cultural difference feel better, right? Because mm -hmm. I think we've gone through a, a, a period where we were just so deprived and so insecure and just so beaten up by like the stereotypes not being heard that we all want to be heard but the way to do it is not by tearing each other down or pointing out each other's differences it should be celebrating what we have in common and it always goes back to that because i i know for me being in recovery or being an adoptee mm -hmm. looking for the differences will create a terminal uniqueness and we will feel miserable mm. we will feel insecure doubtful and it's not good for any of us belonging definitely looks different uh the reason why i started my company it's called sans by uh tajin beverage inc is that when i was first getting sober six and a half years ago whenever i'd go out to a bar a restaurant or, or a special occasion i'd feel insecure really weird mm. didn't feel like i belonged or i was being judged by not drinking yeah. started a beverage that is a non-alcoholic alternative and a mixer it's a 10 calorie dragon uh, dragon ginger beer that is inspired to normalize and empower sobriety mm. in people who don't drink yeah. so we have a place when we go out and I wanted to symbolize belonging that we belong here just without the alcohol yeah. and so my tagline is be a part of the buzz without the booze and it's <laughs> Ooh, like, I like uh, that. Is that your tagline? yeah yes. it's it's about belonging and we don't have to do it by drinking all the time because I know most of you are allergic let's not lie <laughs> you know <laughs> health fact it's not good for your liver <laughs> yes. but so uh, I definitely wanted to empower that community and that's why I did it because I knew what it felt like to feel like an outsider who didn't drink same thing with being Asian I know what it feels like to be an outsider mm. in a white community or even within ourselves yeah. and I think that's the worst when we feel like an outsider within ourselves this question is for Kevin, Kevin. primarily, of but course. other panelists, feel free to <laughs> jump in. Um, I'm curious if you've ever had invisible wars. Invisible wars. Genuinely curious. Um, it's like when you're at a party or a social function or a corporate event, some other social function, you're the only Asian person in the room and then another Asian person goes into yes. the room. Yes, uh, so in my modeling world, uh, 
I modeled for a long time. It was absolutely there, 100%. Invisible Wars. Huh. I still have it today with uh, other Asian actors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, wow. I grew up with a lot of them. I, we know each other, but uh, for some reason, there's this you don't talk to each other thing. From them, by the way, I always try to say hi. They, they make it super awkward for some reason, you know? It's like, I don't know. They're fighting a war that I don't know about, apparently. <laughs> but I know what you're Fate. talking about. I experience that and I huh. see that. But I, I definitely believe that comes from insecurity. Because, like, if you're not insecure, then why don't we help each other? Or why don't we at least acknowledge each other's uh, 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 c celebrations, what we've achieved? So um, as long as I have a faith that I'm going to get mine and you'll get yours, whatever you try to do, no matter hard, how hard we try, there's no invisible war. Uh, but I used to do that, too, when I was in college. I saw another guy who was wearing the same Abercrombie shirt as me. He was Asian. Oh, no. I couldn't believe it. Oh, no. <laughs> Never talked to that guy again. <laughs> but that's my invisible war that I had back then, yes. So my, my question is mainly geared uh, towards Kevin. I was wondering, what experience have you had in uh, securing brand deals and sponsorships oh. as an Asian-American male um, in an entertainment? And um, then yeah. also, like, what... Uh, I'm glad you asked that because actually yeah. it's been very challenging. Mm. Um, I've been modeling for 12 years. I actually had to say goodbye to it because it's been over two and a half years since I've actually done a modeling job. Crazy, right? You think 12 years of being an established model, actor, mm. uh, agencies, I had the best agencies, two seasons of successful Bling Empire, not one endorsement knocked on my door. Mm. Like not one product or brand wanted me to be the face to represent them. So to, han to answer your question, it's a lot of hard work right now still. And my thing is, that's why I don't think, it. to me, it's not a woe is me. It's like, okay, I'm going to focus on what I can do, which is my beverage company that I'm starting up. Maybe I'll be the face of that, and I can help other people. And maybe I can actually have an Asian face like you actually endorse it and be an ambassador for it, give you the <laughs> opportunity. So I want to also be successful because I want to practice what I preach. I want to walk the walk and talk the talk. So my thing is it's been extremely tough. There's been zero. And uh, it's just the reality we face as Asian men, to be real. I don't know if it's as hard of a thing for Asian women, but for Asian men, it is still of an uphill battle. That's why I don't think we, as Asian men, should have those invisible wars. We should actually be helping each other. What you're going to get as an endorsement, I'm not going to get. We're very different people. So I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a war between us. We should probably help each other out. Hi, this is Snow. I am from PwC, and this question is for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> and once you hear my question, you will know why. Oh. So my question will be around Asian male stereotype, specifically the desexualization of Asian male, especially in the Hollywood industry. Mm -hmm. So Asian male has been stereotyped as unsexual, unattractive, mm -hmm. and we have been given roles as like um, nerdy and uh, attractive and really just um, those m sidekick characters um, because of our uh, ma masculine body um, according to the definition of Western masculinity. So I wanted to know what's your um, view on this, this stereotype and how does this stereotype have any influence on you? I mean, that's probably why I'm here, because it's affected me so much growing up. I didn't have any of those Asian male role models to look up to. Um, and the problem that we see is in, like, even in technology today, right? Asian males don't get to be in front of the algorithms anymore. Dating, social media, we have to fight for it. Uh, and so I think there's a problem with that. And actually, like Jeremy said, we co-founders and founders are the leaders of that, but where are they? Like, we should be doing something about that. So I think for what your, your the answer is, it's affected us very much. 
there's something to do and there's an opportunity for it, you can share your experience of overcoming it and that can inspire the future generation to become better and to become more secure and self-assured of their sexuality uh, or their sexualization more. It also leads into entertainment and media, why it's important to see people that look like us being sexualized, right? I bring a good example up, like we, I watched Thor recently, right? He was very sexualized. Why aren't Asian men like that? You know, like why we should be, we could be, and we, we right. will be. And uh, the thing is, that's how we, that's how we really destigmatize that. That my whole life and career has been based around that actually. <laughs> I, well, I, so I've been following your journey from Philly to Los Angeles and I just commend you for uh, speaking vulnerably um, in media, your TED Talk on YouTube uh, for for ones who are um, curious, you, you spoke very vulnerably um, as an Asian American male mo uh, model in, in media. Um, for me, I'm curious for the community, for ones who are uh, struggling with vulnerability. What is your advice for ones are, who are grappling with their identity issues and just the topic of vulnerability and yeah. opening up? Yeah, I think vulnerability is something that a lot of males, especially Asian males, right? Like we, we could really work on a lot. And I think it starts with hearing it, right? So hearing another role model or somebody uh, you look up to or a peer group who are vulnerable and you learn from by association being around it. I would also say being vulnerable uh, is letting go of wanting to look or sound a certain way. Like you're literally just telling your truth. And when I, when I share my story about being an Asian male, the reason why it's so easy for me and I can be vulnerable mm. is because it's, I'm telling it through my story. Like it's all my experience. Mm. I'm not, there's some opinions in there obviously, but it's all experiential things. And I think it also will develop as you get more experienced and, and a little bit older. I think everybody here is like 25 and under. Yeah, you didn't have time to become vulnerable. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, yeah, I think it comes with a little bit of age too um, and destigmatizing what vulnerability is. We don't always have to look good. And actually, if you don't look good sometimes, you actually end up becoming more relatable and people like you more. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it sounds really weird, but it's like, it's just being yourself. And so I think if you can just start with how, like you, your experience, how you feel, and it's gonna be sloppy in the beginning because most men don't know or haven't been trained to, but it, just know it's gonna be sloppy in the beginning. Just don't do it on social media. <laughs> <laughs> get, get some Good practice point. first. Um, and, then, and then go out in the world and share your story because your story will change people. And I'm playing serious, like your story, if you get good at it, it will change people.